Chapter 3 The Way Out of Undesirable Conditions Having seen and realized that evil is but a passing shadow thrown by the intercepting self across the transcendent form of the eternal good, and that the world is a mirror in which each sees a reflection of himself, we now ascend, by firm and easy steps, to that plane of perception whereon is seen and realized the vision of the law. With this realization comes the knowledge that everything is included in a ceaseless interaction of cause and effect, and that nothing can possibly be divorced from the law. From the most trivial thought, word, or act of man, up to the groupings of celestial bodies, law reigns supreme. No arbitrary condition can, even for one moment, exist, for such a condition would be a denial and an annihilation of law. Every condition of life is, therefore, bound up in an orderly and harmonious sequence, and the secret and cause of every condition is contained within itself. The law, whatsoever a man sows that he shall also reap, is inscribed in flaming letters upon the portal of eternity, and none can deny it, none can cheat it, none can escape it. He who puts his hand in the fire must suffer the burning, until such a time as it has worked itself out, and neither curses nor prayers can avail to alter it. And precisely the same law governs the realm of mind, hatred, anger, jealousy, envy, lust, covetousness. All these are fires which burn, and whoever even so much as touches them must suffer the torments of burning. All these conditions of mind are rightly called evil, for they are the efforts of the soul to subvert, in its ignorance, the law, and they, therefore, lead to chaos and confusion within, and are sooner or later actualized in their outward circumstances as disease, failure, and misfortune, coupled with grief, pain, and despair. Whereas love, gentleness, goodwill, purity, are cooling airs which breathe peace upon the soul that woes them, and, being in harmony with the eternal law, they become actualized in the form of health, peaceful surroundings, and undeviating success and good fortune. A thorough understanding of this great law, which permeates the universe, leads to the acquirement of that state of mind known as obedience. To know that justice, harmony, and love are supreme in the universe, is likewise to know that all adverse and painful conditions are the result of our own disobedience to that law. Such knowledge leads to strength and power, and it is upon such knowledge alone that a true life and an enduring success and happiness can be built. To be patient under all circumstances, and to accept all conditions as necessary factors in your training, is to rise superior to all painful conditions, and to overcome them with an overcoming which is sure, and which leaves no fear of their return, for by the power of obedience to law they are utterly slain. Such an obedient one is working in harmony with the law, has in fact identified himself with the law, and whatsoever he conquers he conquers forever, whatsoever he builds can never be destroyed. The cause of all power, as of all weakness, is within. The secret of all happiness, as of all misery, is likewise within. There is no progress apart from unfoldment within, and no sure foothold of prosperity or peace except by orderly advancement in knowledge. You say you are chained by circumstances. You cry out for better opportunities, for a wider scope, for improved physical conditions, and perhaps you inwardly curse the fate that binds you hand and foot. It is for you that I write, it is for you that I speak. Listen and let my words burn themselves into your heart, for that which I say to you is truth. You may bring about that improved condition in your outward life which you desire, if you unswervingly resolve to improve your inner life. I know this pathway looks barren at its commencement, truth always does, it is only error and delusion which were at first inviting and fascinating. But if you undertake to walk it, if you perseveringly discipline your mind, eradicating your weaknesses, 
and allowing your soul forces and spiritual powers to unfold themselves, you will be astonished at the magical changes which will be brought about in your outward life. As you proceed, golden opportunities will be strewn across your path, and the power and judgment to properly utilize them will spring up within you. Genial friends will come unbidden to you. Sympathetic souls will be drawn to you as the needlers to the magnet, and books and all outward aids that you require will come to you on sort. Perhaps the chains of poverty hang heavily upon you, and you are friendless and alone, and you long with an intense longing that your load may be lightened, but the load continues, and you seem to be enveloped in an ever-increasing darkness. Perhaps you complain, you bewail your lot, you blame your birth, your parents, your employer, or the unjust powers who have bestowed upon you so undeservedly poverty and hardship, and upon another affluence and ease. Cease your complaining and fretting. None of these things which you blame are the cause of your poverty. The cause is within yourself, and where the cause is, there is the remedy. The very fact that you are a complainer shows that you deserve your lot, shows that you lack that faith which is the ground of all effort and progress. There is no room for a complainer in a universe of law, and worry is soul suicide. By your very attitude of mind, you are strengthening the chains which bind you, and are drawing about you the darkness by which you are enveloped. Alter your outlook upon life, and your outward life will alter. Build yourself up in the faith and knowledge, and make yourself worthy of better surroundings and wider opportunities. Be sure, first of all, that you are making the best of what you have. Do not delude yourself into supposing that you can step into greater advantages whilst overlooking smaller ones, for if you could, the advantage would be impermanent, and you would quickly fall back again in order to learn the lesson which you had neglected. As the child at school must master one standard before passing on to the next, so, before you can have that greater good which you so desire, you must faithfully employ that which you already possess. The parable of the talents is a beautiful story illustrative of this truth, for does it not plainly show that if we misuse, neglect, or degrade that which we possess, be it ever so mean and insignificant, even that little would be taken from us, for... By our conduct, we show that we are unworthy of it. Perhaps you are living in a small cottage, and are surrounded by unhealthy and vicious influences. You desire a larger and more sanitary residence. Then you must fit yourself for such a residence, by first of all making your cottage as far as possible a little paradise. Keep it spotlessly clean. Make it look as pretty and as sweet as your limited means will allow. Cook your plain food with all care, and arrange your humble table as tastefully as you possibly can. If you cannot afford a carpet, let your rooms be carpeted with smiles and welcomes, fastened down with the nails of kind words, driven in with the hammer of patience. Such a carpet will not fade in the sun, and constant use will never wear it away. By so ennobling your present surroundings, you will rise above them, and above the need of them and at the right time you will pass on into the better house and surroundings which have all along been waiting for you, and which you have fitted yourself to occupy. Perhaps you desire more time for thought and effort, and feel that your hours of labour are too hard and long. Then see to it that you are utilising to the fullest possible extent what little spare time you have. It is useless to desire more time if you are already wasting what little you have, for you would only grow more indolent and indifferent. Even poverty and lack of time and leisure are not the evils that you imagine they are, and if they hinder you in your progress, it is because you have clothed them in your own weaknesses, and the evil that you see in them is really in yourself. Endeavour to fully and completely realise that in so far as you shape and mould your mind, you are maker of your destiny, and as... By the transmuting power of self-discipline, you realize this more and more. You will come to see that these so-called evils may be converted into blessings. You will then utilize your poverty for the cultivation of patience, hope and courage, and your lack of time 
in the gaining of promptness of action and decision of mind, by seizing the precious moments as they present themselves for your acceptance. As in the rankest soil the most beautiful flowers are grown, so in the dark soil of poverty the choicest flowers of humanity have developed and bloomed. Where there are difficulties to cope with, and unsatisfactory conditions to overcome, there virtue most flourishes and manifests its glory. It may be that you are in the employ of a tyrannous master or mistress, and you feel that you are harshly treated. Look upon this also as necessary to your training. Return your employer's unkindness with gentleness and forgiveness. Practice unceasingly patience and self-control. Turn the disadvantage to account by utilizing it for the gaining of mental and spiritual strength, and by your silent example and influence, you will thus be teaching your employer, who will be helping him to grow ashamed of his conduct, and will, at the same time, be lifting yourself up to that height of spiritual attainment by which you will be enabled to step into new and more congenial surroundings at the time when they are presented to you. Do not complain that you are a slave, but lift yourself up, by noble conduct, above the plane of slavery. Before complaining that you are a slave to another, be sure that you are not a slave to self. Look within, look searchingly, and have no mercy upon yourself. You will find there, perchance, slavish thoughts, slavish desires, and in your daily life and conduct, slavish habits. Conquer these. Cease to be a slave to self, and no man will have the power to enslave you. As you overcome self, you will overcome all adverse conditions, and every difficulty will fall before you. Do not complain that you are oppressed by the rich. Are you sure that if you gained these riches you would not be an oppressor yourself? Remember that there is the eternal law, which is absolutely just, and he who oppresses today must himself be oppressed tomorrow, and from this there is no way of escape. And perhaps you, yesterday, in some former existence, were rich in an oppressor, and that you are now merely paying off the debt which you owe to the great law. Practice, therefore, fortitude and faith. Dwell constantly in the mind upon the eternal justice, the eternal good. Endeavor to lift yourself above the personal and the transitory into the impersonal and permanent. Shake off the delusion that you are being injured or oppressed by another, and try to realize, by a profounder comprehension of your inner life and the laws which govern that life, that you are only really being injured by what is within you. There is no practice more degrading, debasing, and soul-destroying than that of self-pity. Cast it out from you. While such a canker is feeding upon your heart, you can never expect to grow into a fuller life. Cease from the condemnation of others, and begin to condemn yourself. Condone none of your acts, desires, or thoughts that will not bear comparison with spotless purity, or endure the light of sinless good. By so doing, you will be building your house upon the rock of the Eternal, and all that is required for your happiness and well-being will come to you in its own time. There is positively no way of permanently rising above poverty, or any undesirable condition, except by eradicating those selfish and negative conditions within, of which these are the reflection, and by virtue of which they continue. The way to true riches is to enrich the soul by the acquisition of virtue. Outside of real heart virtue, there is neither prosperity nor power, but only the appearances of these. I am aware that men make money who have acquired no measure of virtue, and have little desire to do so. But such money does not constitute true riches, and its possession is transitory and feverish. Here is David's testimony. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. The prosperity of the wicked was a great trial to David, until he went into the sanctuary of God, and then he knew their end. You likewise may go into that sanctuary. It is within you. 
it is that state of consciousness which remains when all that is sordid and personal and impermanent is risen above and universal and eternal principles are realized. That is the God state of consciousness. It is the sanctuary of the Most High, when by long strife and self-discipline you have succeeded in entering the door of that holy temple, you will perceive, with unobstructed vision, the end and fruit of all human thought and endeavor, both good and evil. You will then no longer relax your faith when you see the immoral man accumulating outward riches, for you will know that he must come again to poverty and degradation. The rich man who is barren of virtue is, in reality, poor, and as surely as the waters of the river are drifting to the ocean, so surely is he, in the midst of all his riches, drifting towards poverty and misfortune. And though he die rich, yet he must return to reap the bitter fruit of all his immorality. And though he may become rich many times, yet as many times must he be thrown back into poverty, until, by long experience and suffering, he conquers the poverty within. But the man who is outwardly poor, yet rich in virtue, is truly rich, and, in the midst of all his poverty, he is surely travelling towards prosperity, and abounding joy and bliss await his coming. If you would become truly and permanently prosperous, you must first become virtuous. It is therefore unwise to aim directly at prosperity, to make it the one object of life, to reach out greedily for it. To do this is to ultimately defeat yourself, but rather aim at self-perfection, make useful and unselfish service the object of your life, and ever reach out hands of faith towards the supreme and unalterable good. You say you desire wealth, not for your own sake, but in order to do good with it, and to bless others. If this is your real motive in desiring wealth, then wealth will come to you, for you are strong and unselfish indeed if, in the midst of riches, you are willing to look upon yourself as steward and not as owner. But examine well your motive, for in the majority of instances where money is desired for the admitted object of blessing others, the real underlying motive is a love of popularity and a desire to pose as a philanthropist or reformer. If you are not doing good with what little you have, depend upon it the more money you got, the more selfish you would become, and all the good you appeared to do with your money, if you attempted to do any, would be so much insinuating self-laudation. If your real desire is to do good, there is no need to wait for money before you do it. You can do it now, this very moment, and just where you are. If you are really so unselfish as you believe yourself to be, you will show it by sacrificing yourself for others now. No matter how poor you are, there is room for self-sacrifice. For did not the widow put her all into the treasury? The heart that truly desires to do good does not wait for money before doing it, but comes to the altar of sacrifice and, leaving there the unworthy elements of self, goes out and breathes upon neighbor and stranger, friend and enemy alike, the breath of blessedness. As the effect is related to the cause, so is prosperity and power related to the inward good, and poverty and weakness to the inward evil. Money does not constitute true wealth, nor position, nor power, and to rely upon it alone is to stand upon a slippery place. Your true wealth is your stock of virtue, and your true power the uses to which you put it. Rectify your heart, and you will rectify your life. Lust, hatred, anger, vanity, pride, covetousness, self-indulgence, self-seeking, obstinacy, all these are poverty and weakness, whereas love, purity, gentleness, meekness, compassion, generosity, self-forgetfulness, and self-renunciation all these are wealth and power. As the elements of poverty and weakness are overcome, an irresistible and all-conquering power is evolved from within, and he who succeeds in establishing himself in the highest virtue brings the whole world to his feet. But the rich, as well as the poor, have their undesirable conditions, 
and are frequently farther removed from happiness than the poor. And here we see how happiness depends, not upon outward aids or possessions, but upon the inward life. Perhaps you are an employer, and you have endless trouble with those whom you employ, and when you do get good and faithful servants, they quickly leave you. As a result, you are beginning to lose, or have completely lost, your faith in human nature. You try to remedy matters by giving better wages, by allowing certain liberties, yet matters remain unaltered. Let me advise you, the secret of all your trouble is not in your servants, it is in yourself. And if you look within, with a humble and sincere desire to discover and eradicate your error, you will, sooner or later, find the origin of all your unhappiness. It may be some selfish desire, or lurking suspicion, or unkind attitude of mind which sends out its poison upon those about you, and reacts upon yourself, even though you may not show it in your manner or speech. Think of your servants with kindness. Consider of them that extremity of service which you yourself would not care to perform were you in their place. Rare and beautiful is that humility of soul by which a servant entirely forgets himself in his master's good. But far rarer, with a beautiful and divine beauty, is that nobility of soul by which a man, forgetting his own happiness, seeks the happiness of those who are under his authority and who depend upon him for their bodily sustenance and such a man's happiness is increased tenfold, nor does he need to complain of those whom he employs. Set a well-known and extensive employer of labor, who never needs to dismiss an employee. I have always had the happiest relations with my work people. If you ask me how it is to be accounted for, I can only say that it has been my aim from the first to do to them as I would wish to be done by. Herein lies the secret by which all desirable conditions are secured, and all that are undesirable are overcome. Do you say that you are lonely and unloved, and have not a friend in the world? Then, I pray you, for the sake of your own happiness, blame nobody but yourself. Be friendly towards others, and friends will soon flock round you. Make yourself pure and lovable, and you will be loved by all. Whatever conditions are rendering your life burdensome, you may pass out of and beyond them by developing and utilizing within you the transforming power of self-purification and self-conquest. Be it the poverty which goals, and remember that the poverty upon which I have been dilating is that poverty which is a source of misery, and not that voluntary poverty which is the glory of emancipated souls, or the riches which burden, or the many misfortunes, griefs and annoyances which form the dark background and the web of life, you may overcome them by overcoming the selfish elements within which give them life. It matters not that by the unfailing law there are past thoughts and acts to work out and to atone for, as, by the same law, we are setting in motion, during every moment of our life, fresh thoughts and acts, and we have the power to make them good or ill. Nor does it follow that if a man, reaping what he has sown, must lose money or forfeit position, that he must also lose his fortitude or forfeit his uprightness, and it is in these that his wealth and power and happiness are to be found. He who clings to self is his own enemy and is surrounded by enemies. He who relinquishes self is his own saviour and is surrounded by friends like a protecting belt. Before the divine radiance of a pure heart, all darkness vanishes and all clouds melt away, and he who has conquered self has conquered the universe. Come, then, out of your poverty, come out of your pain, come out of your troubles and sighings and complainings and heartaches and loneliness by coming out of yourself. Let the old tattered garment of your petty selfishness fall from you, and put on the new garment of universal love. You will then realize the inward heaven, and it will be reflected in all your outward life. He who sets his foot firmly upon the path of self-conquest, who walks, aided by the staff of faith, the highway of self-sacrifice, will assuredly achieve the highest prosperity, and will reap abounding and enduring joy and bliss. To them that seek the highest good, 
All things subserve the wisest ends. Nought comes as ill, and wisdom lends wings to all shapes of evil brood. The darkening sorrow veils a star, that waits to shine with gladsome light. Hell waits on heaven, and after night comes golden glory from afar. Defeats are steps by which we climb, with purer aim to nobler ends. Loss leads to gain, and joy attends, true footsteps up the hills of time. Pain leads to paths of holy bliss, to thoughts and words and deeds divine, and clouds that gloom and rays that shine, along life's upward highway kiss. Misfortune does not but cloud the way, whose end and summit in the sky, of bright success, sun-kissed and high, awaits our seeking and our stay. The heavy pall of doubts and fears, that cloud the valley of our hopes, the shades with which the spirit copes, the bitter harvesting of tears, the heartaches, miseries and griefs, the bruisings born of broken ties, all these are steps by which we rise, to living ways of sound beliefs. Love, pitying, watchful, runs to meet, the pilgrim from the land of fate, all glory and all good await, the coming of obedient feet. End of chapter 3